Hi guys, it's Dan Lanny here, host of the How to Scale a Video Business podcast. And this week, we're revisiting a conversation that we started last week with Adam Forgione from Penny Lane Productions in New York. Adam's a veteran business owner, started his life in weddings and moved fully into corporate production and now serves multiple markets in nonprofit, construction, healthcare. And today, we, we're going to dig deep into the the kind of the nuts and bolts of sales and tracking business inquiries. We're going to talk about CRMs. We're going to talk about the process of following up and the importance of multiple touch points of follow up so that you can get to a point where when someone is ready to buy, you become an obvious choice. Because in most cases, no one really wants what you're selling at the point at which you first make contact. So you want to begin a journey of awareness, nurture, and then, you know, turning that into trust. You're going to really enjoy this episode. Please be sure to like and subscribe on the platforms that you watch or listen to this on and enjoy this episode. Adam, thank you for coming back. We had a really powerful conversation last week about customer service and how most large corporations get it wrong. And actually, to some level, how, how a lot of video production companies are getting it wrong because they're, they're not getting back in touch with customers and prospects quick enough. And, and I think that's partly down to fear. I, I think a lot of creatives ha- have a real fear of rejection, and therefore, when an inquiry comes in, will sometimes write an email or ping back a response a few days later and we were having a really good discussion about the importance of being quick how, how how do you how do you build up the confidence with that and what kind of systems you use you touched on the crm last week and you know i i'm quite surprised when i talk about crm how few filmmakers necessarily understand what it is and even use one um so Let's just start there for this this conversation because I think, you know, between us we've got a lot of experience and I think it's very easy for us who've been doing this, you know, 20, 20 plus years that we just we just automatically think, oh, it's just, of course you've got a CRM. But let's just like take it back to a, a company that's perhaps a little bit younger. Um, how, how did you build the skill around the confidence of getting back to cold inquiries and calling them up rather than sending an email? I think that confidence was built when I was running a video, uh, a wedding video business. You know, I mean, in the beginning, it was mostly calls. Email wasn't as common when I first started. And then when email became more common, um, you know, it was convenient because it was quick and you didn't have to stay on the phone for 30 minutes or or so. Um, But I I, I don't know. I, I, I don't really... I don't really know if I have an answer. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm a very forward guy. I'm a very blunt guy. I'm, I'm not afraid of, um, you know, having conversations. I'm not afraid of being in front of people. I'm not afraid of um, speaking to small or large crowds. I, I'm, I, and, and, and I'm, I think there are a lot of people that have issue with that just because that's, how they're built. You know, I have, I have flaws on other ends that they, they, they might not have flaws on, but I, I don't know. I think for me, it's natural. I'm, I'm not afraid of confrontation, confrontation. I don't want confrontation, but I won't, won't walk away from it. Mm. I notice a lot of people will, and maybe, maybe they're smarter than me. <laughs> maybe that's a weakness. Of mine. <laughs> but I, I just, I, think, I just, um, I, I think just care a- about what I care about. And I, I, I want to stand up for myself and I, I don't want to get walked over. So I, I, you know, I think wow. that's a fair, a fair comment, you know, and, and, you know, with, with experience, we all develop skills that we kind of don't even realize are skills because we've been doing them so long, but I think there's, a, you know, a lot of people came into the industry 2009 to 2012 um, who, who were very new to the video business and we're now kind of like 10 years on and I'm, and I'm observing a lot of like the technology has gone crazy, right? I mean, what you can do on an iPhone now, gimbals, you know, FPV drones, the tools that are available, 
we could only have dreamed of even 10 years ago when like the DSLR came out. We were like, we're not using lens adapters anymore. Wow. And now the technology is incredible. So the, the barrier to entry to make beautiful looking content is, is like zero. You know, it's 5,000 bucks. You've got all the tools you need. But I wonder if there's a lag in the business skills because a lot of those that generation have grown up with phones and computer games. And I remember my, my stepson sitting in front of the Xbox and, and us saying, why don't you go outside? And he's like, you guys don't understand. This is how we communicate these days. So there's all these, these kids who grew up in 10 years ago who are now becoming videographers, video businesses. Um, and, and, and I see this a lot with the conversations I have. Nobody wants to get on the phone. People want to respond on instant message or they want to send an email. And a lot of times there's a resistance to that, but also no system, no CRM. And by CRM, I mean customer relationship management software, somewhere to put prospect data, customer data. When you have a phone call, make some notes, put them in there because not everyone's ready to buy straight away. Um, I guess I want to, I want to, share maybe how you do things to help perhaps filmmakers listening to this or watching this to get some understanding of what kind of process needs to be in place and why that's important. So I'm thinking specifically about inquiry comes in because you know you can do all this social media marketing, all of the front end SEO, but when a prospect makes an inquiry, so much as can be lost by someone not getting in touch quick enough, but also not having a process to nurture that opportunity into a point when they're ready to buy something. Yeah, I mean, so specifically, we use Zoho CRM Plus. Yes. And there's a lot, you know, and I have a love-hate relationship with, with Zoho, but um, it's a very powerful tool. I've tried Salesforce. Um, I've, I've tried a lot of different CRMs and... Um, I, I still, I, I, this fits me the best. It thinks the way I it's think. It's very powerful and it kind of, there's lots of bolt-ons. It does everything, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's funny because there's a few things that are so obvious that it should do. And you go on forums from like 10 years ago and they're like, yeah, we sh you know, everybody wants this feature. Why are you not doing it? Everybody else has it. And they're like, oh, we'll consider it. And then 10 years goes on and you're like, yeah. I guess you're not doing this. Yeah. So there's, there's that kind of a like love hate relationship, but yeah, you're, you're right. It's super powerful. So for us, um, you know, for starters, I can, any, when I was in the wedding world, I never deleted emails. So now I had 15 years of brides and grooms, whether I booked them or not. Um, I imported all that into my CRM. And I said, you know what? They probably, most, most of them might probably have jobs. Maybe they own their own businesses. I could probably do business with them. These are potential leads. They contacted me because they liked something on my website and wanted to potentially do business with me. Mm. That's how I got their name. Yeah. Not a cold lead. So right off the bat, you have all these warm leads. Now, granted, you know, you're still, you're calling them back for something that they didn't call you for, mm. but, but, but you're one step closer. You're definitely beyond a cold call or a cold lead. So boom, got those in. Um, so it basically, you know, every single time somebody emails me, every single time somebody calls me, once that information, we have some sort of communication, that communication is then copied into that person's, um, you know, notes in, inside the CRM. And for those who, like you mentioned, the CRM, I mean, it's, think of it as like a, a Rolodex on steroids. I mean, you have everything under the sun about that person, not to mention you can automate your CRMs to do a lot of powerful things like, you know, either remind you to email them in six months or two months or two weeks. You can have it automatically send an email for you. You can add them automatically, you know, have them dump to an email list. If you wanted to, you can track them or try to track them on social. There's even on Zoho, I can even tell if you're in my CRM and we have 10, we have over 10,000 leads in our CRM. So in our CRM, if one of those people, I have their email, if one of those people hits my website, there's a good chance it's going to understand what the IP address is going to match it to who that person is. And it's going to 
say to me, I'll see it live and say, you know, John Smith is on your website and he's on this web page. And now he's been there for two minutes and he hopped over to the next web page. And I can clearly see what he's clicking on and what he's interested in. You know, and I'm not even using Google Analytics at this point. This is all within my CRM. So if you take that tool and you nurture it, you use it, and then you take other tools like, you know, studying how people are coming onto your website, like um, Google Search Console and, and Google Analytics. And, you know, there are paid programs that you can buy. Like currently I use Ahrefs. So that's a just, you know, it's like Google console search console on steroids and you can you could look at your competition you can look at your own you could figure out all the problems you have on your website and all that stuff so you you, know, you fix all these holes and you you have more people coming into your website more people emailing you every time they email you you can even set it up where it automatically goes into your crm if they email you you don't even have to do it manually i personally do it manually because i like to keep control of everything i don't want like spammy stuff going in there um but and then, you know, make, make a process that makes sense to you. Maybe for one person, you know, I say, okay, I'm going to reach out to this person or they, they contacted me. I need to ask them these five questions in order to understand their needs better. And we have this conversation and then it maybe it just goes dead. Maybe you have a process. If, if they become MIA in two weeks, email them this email, right? And then boom, goes out. And then if no response, Set a reminder, send another email in one week or two weeks or whatever your time process is. If they respond, then, you know, it might lead somewhere and take that mm. where it leads. And then, you know, after what I do is I hit them up three times. And on the third time, if, if they're MIA, they go to a dead lead um, list, but that basically means they're on a mail list now. Yeah. And then they're not, and, and if they unsubscribe, then they're dead, dead. They're still in my system, but they're in a, a pile that is just, it, you know, they have to revive themselves. So, and the um, but, chances, if someone's going to unsubscribe, they're never probably going to give you money. Yeah. I you mean, know? you know, most people in my list are not interested in me right now, maybe yeah. later, but they're just not interested in me right now, you know, and you just keep chipping away. It's a, it's a, one thing I learned too, is it's a numbers game. So, yeah. you know, you, some, you know, how many times did Edison, experiment with the light bulb before he nailed it you know and what if he gave up one try yeah. before he did it and there's so many stories like this so it's a numbers game it's sales and marketing it's the same thing yeah. over and over again a, a, he, a mentor of mine said you know you have to be willing he, he he shared lessons from 20 years in business and he said um you have to put in 10 times the effort you think to get the result you want and so that really translates to a numbers game and something I experience with, with creatives and filmmakers is they, they give up too quick on the sales and marketing process. They might do LinkedIn outreach for a week and they're like, Oh, I reached out to hundred people. I didn't get any sales. So I've, I'm deflated now. I'm giving up. And there's definitely a, in sales and marketing, you, you made a great point there. Most people aren't interested in what you're selling right now because they don't have a big enough pain or a big enough need. And sales and marketing is about continually repeating your message in front of people so that when they are ready, you're already a factor in their mind. You know, in the coaching space, no one comes to me when business is great. And I've been tracking annually the, the flow of clients in and out of our business. And you know what? January, February, is always a boom time for us with people signing up because they're like, oh, I've had a month off. It's quiet. January is always quiet in the video industry. And they're like, I need some help. But no one's, no one's knocking on my door in August. In fact, I see clients drop off in August almost consistently year on year for the last six years. I see a percentage of clients drop out of programs because they've had a great summer. Work is booming. There's money in the bank. They've just been on holiday and they don't need help anymore. And, and that's like in any industry, there is a cycle. Yeah. And so you've got, as long as you're aware of that, um, I think the, the, the average, the, there was a, there was a, there was a graph released and I don't know where it came from, but it, it was like a percentage of, um, you know, m most people give up after the first contact. And then, you know, like 78% of people give up after the second contact and 
you know, there's only like by contact point number six, seven, and eight, you're literally, there's no competition. And if you connect with someone six, seven, eight times, the chances are you're the only company who's maintained contact for that many touch points. I mean, and if you get it, to nine so and true. 10, you become a, such a strong factor in that person's mind that when they do need someone, they're probably not going to look anywhere beyond the person that's made the most effort. I mean, it's so true. And, and, and there are marketing and sales professionals that are, can run circles around me. I learn stuff every single day and I, I, I and, and there are, there are sales and marketing professionals that are way more persistent, persistent than I am too, as well. And I have so much admiration for that. I mean, think about the touch points. You, you know, I hear that all the time, seven, eight, nine, all the way up to like 14 touch points before they want to do business with you. It depends on what you're selling, mm -hmm. how high or low the ticket item is and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, think about the ways you could be touched, you know, phone call, email, in person, on the website, an ad on Facebook, an ad on any other social media, a genu genuine organic post on any of the social medias, you being ranked high up where they search something and they find you as relevant as one of the, the ranking sites after they did a search, um, DMs. There's so many different ways to connect with people. So, you know, if you think about it, if if they saw your ad three times and they saw a post you put out on one of the social media channels twice and you called them twice and you emailed them once, I mean, you, you already have all these touch points. The probability of them doing business with you, if there is a fit, is more likely, is way more likely. The whole thing too is that I think a lot of us can potentially do business together. We're always here, mm. but we're always passing by like this constantly. And we just never reach out at this point. So yes. if you're constantly reaching out, you know, I'm going to hit 15, 20 leads every single day for the next year. Chances are you're going to hit somebody that happens to be lined at the perfect point. Boom. And those numbers are just going to align. And, and that's, that's part of that numbers game. But I even, you know, I was, I went to your, um, your coaching website and I signed up. Yeah. I saw day. that. I saw the that. Other day I yeah. signed up because I know I can learn a ton from you. Yeah. And I watched the initial intro video. Um, I didn't, put my name in the thing yet because i knew i was going to talk to you yeah exactly but, but, but i love that i saw that coming i was like he's he's checking out what what's happening and it's, that's but, but that's that's a funnel right it's it's like it is. what's new and i loved what you said on the video i mean the one thing that that struck me like the holy grail of everything that i got from what you said on that video was what your focus in niches yeah and and that is like it is so true and i I had, can't tell you how many times I had to drag myself away from the generalist yeah. to be like, Adam, you got to focus on this one little thing. You got to focus on, you know, and, and I'm building out, I'm building out niches for uh, attorneys for law, Yeah, I'm building out niches for healthcare. I'm building out niches for finance. I'm building out niches for construction and building out niches for nonprofit. Yeah. You know, aside from just being a generalist, you know, corporate video company, um, those niches are, I, I really see a lot more potential focused on that laser focused thing. And the examples you were giving in your intro video um, were great examples. It's so powerful. Mm. And, uh, you, you know, you reminded me of that. And then of course, like um, I go through my phases, but we, we're both audiobook fans. Yeah. Uh, or business book fans. Yeah. I, I listen to audio books. I, I barely read books. So I'm always yeah. listening. So I don't know if you're, or you read or you, you I, I do both, but yeah, like when, when I'm okay. doing long drives, I'm always audio books. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, I always circle back to this every so often. So I'm, I'm, I'm on thinking grow rich again. Yeah. And uh, you know, you, you, you go, I'm away for it for two years and I'm like, ah, I gotta keep remembering this. All right. Put it back in because the, sure the enough, principles of business haven't changed in a hundred years. No, and but or the, marketing the or sales. In there. Like, there's a whole chapter on specialization. Mm. You know, it's it's it, and it's funny because I'm literally I hit that chapter the day after I watched your video. How funny! 
You know what I but mean? Here's like, the thing. I know there's here's a sign there. There's a sign going but on. But here's the thing as well, Adam. Is like, and 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 I guess one of my mantras has always been go niche, go niche, go niche, or go niche, go niche, go niche. And and it and people get very confused thinking that going niche means that's only what you ever do. I have a client, Grant, who niched down into manufacturing and uh, distribution and and haulage and like you know um for a year built his website for a year went hard on linkedin for a year got some great business but realized that manufacturing companies just didn't really have a marketing strategy and therefore he was having to sell the concept of video and that was really hard during that time he was approached by someone who was a contact on linkedin who ran um aged care homes and said hey could you would you be interested in doing this project ended up with like 15 videos over a year to do aged care let's call it 150 grand's worth of business and Great. so so the the niching is about the focus of your attention and marketing and i've got dozens of stories where someone is niched down in one industry but gets an amazing opportunity from a completely different industry that ends up being a great business opportunity so I think, you know, the first thing is niching down is about focus, but there's no reason why you as a company can't have a healthcare division, an attorney division, a construction division, as long as each page talks the language of that industry. Then when someone comes in from the construction world, you point them to construction page. When someone comes in from the healthcare space, you're starting to talk about patient care and and the, the work that you do as an organization and so it's really just um and it's probably where i'm the most misunderstood but i guess that's why in any business you, you keep banging the same drum is niching down isn't about only ever making a healthcare film it's about the marketing message and more importantly your focus so you that know, you're it, not di diluting what you do in 15 different directions. I mean, the way I look at it is this, you, you knit, you, first off, is it niche or niche? Well, <clears throat> it's niche where I live. It's, I think it's niche in America. So we kind of, you know, niche or niche. I think I it's understood. It's like tomato, tomato, you know? Yeah. So the way I look at it is this, you're, you're the expert in that field. So if anybody needs video in that field, they're going to take you over everyone else. That's because right. You're the expert, A, right? And, you know, the, 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 the main thing too is that um, you, you know, when you, when you do work in that industry or that niche with various different clients, um, you learn a lot. And that education... And that knowledge that you can share, even on these initial sales calls with other people, um, it's really, it, it's noticeable. I mean, so like I, nonprofit is, is an, a niche that I've been in for many years. And I know so much more about nonprofits and how they operate than I did 10 years ago. And, you know, I, like right off the bat, an example is this um, fundraising videos are so powerful, especially when they're played at an event right before they ask for donations. And it's a perfectly, it's a perfect tool and it's developed for that moment, right? So, and it's what the a cool thing about it is it's, it can potentially be measurable too. So I was actually talking to a friend of mine um, I don't want to say her name because I don't know if she would want me to say her name, but um, I, I became friends with her recently and she's a, a f filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker. And we were literally just having this conversation, I don't know, a day or two ago. And this is exactly what she was saying too. She was actually, we were bouncing the idea across about, you know, ways to build on it and make it better and educate clients. And, you know, this this exact conversation was happening about, um, how not, uh, fundraising videos are measurable. So it's, it, this is just one micro example, but you know, you make an emotional film, emotional video 
you play it right before the ask at a gala. They're in an emotional state. And there's a very good chance that the amount of money you'll raise after that video is shown will be higher than if you'd never shown that video before it. And for us, emotion, how we create emotion, how we look for emotion, very simple formula. It's got to be an interview. Can't be looking at the camera lens. It's got to be a, a documentary interview uh, where you're looking off camera. And, you know, here's one of many formulas that we might use for storytelling. If we wanted to make a, a short three minute video, act one, act two, act three, act one. We do a lot of uh, nonprofits with chill related to children with illnesses, right? That's a niche. That's like a micro niche within nonprofit. And we do a lot of those. So act one, what was the child's life before he or she got sick? Act two or the inciting incident, the moment that that child got sick, turned everyone's life upside down. And that leads into act two, the journey of that child as that child's sick and you know what direction they're going in and what they've accomplished at the end and in most cases there's usually a happy ending where the child is now part of you know speaking at an event that night and they're being honored that night from you know of the gala so you know the the act three is sort of like um you know the happy ending now i'm in remission and um I've gained a whole new set of friends that I never would have met had I not gone through this. And I learned things about life that I probably wouldn't have learned about until my 20s or 30s. And so all these things that they were sort of rewarded with from this horrible thing that happened to them um, is celebrated at the end of that video. And then everyone feels, you know, everyone's in tears, but at the end, everyone feels good about, you know, wow, we're rooting for the kid he or she made it and I feel so good and I'm so happy for you. And, and, and you know, and, and so you're, you're just like, and then now, look, now we, we need to help so many more kids, you know, now's the time. So, you know, they take your wallets out, get your checkbooks out, but it's a great tool just for that specific niche. And it, you know, you can go to like a, example attorneys, every attorney, almost every attorney has an FAQ. There are not many with video FAQs. So if you get into an accident, what do you do next? You know, so, you know, you're reading, you have video FAQs. These are like little ideas that you have just for that specific niche. So, you know, you pick your niche and you can come up with these different ideas for each one of them. And then you can go through this sort of menu of creative things that can help them drum up more business. And, you know, that's but how what's I look so at cool it. is that you as as an expert in 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 nonprofits and the sub niches within nonprofits, when a nonprofit's looking for a video supplier, and they've got a choice between Billy Bob's videos over here and Mary Smith's videos over here, and Penny Lane, oh, those are the guys who they they their niche is um, nonprofits, and and they have this formula and they have this way of doing things, and we know about them because. My friend who works at this other charity or this other nonprofit told me about these guys. You just end up, you know, it's like you talked last week about SEO being this very labor intensive monolithic journey of micro decisions and changes that take a very long time to bed in. But after a period of time, they're, they're almost hard to get rid of because they're so embedded. They're so sort of, um, the foundation is so strong in the ground. The same thing is true of niching or niching. You become known as the guy or the company that provides these results and you become so good at it that the entire industry of nonprofits is like, if they were to be asked, who's, who are the top three companies in the country you should use, your name would come up. And that is a kind of a, a version of SEO for your business in niching. And, yeah. and it's, 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 I've seen it over the last 10 years. I've been working with video businesses, the ones that thrive and do exceptionally well, have a niche. It might be a style. It might be an approach. It might be a couple of different sectors, but they get known for it. And what hap what is so powerful about niching or niching is that you get known in that industry and people tell each other.
Yeah. I mean, one thing to go back to something you said earlier, by the way, can you hear my daughter singing and play piano? I can't, but I wish we could. I've seen yeah. the videos in the past. I think, I think we're, uh, it might be noise suppressing it, but I hear my, my daughter playing piano downstairs. Um, so, which I love. <laughs> so what, um, what I was going to say, you said earlier too, is I think one of the biggest takeaways for any filmmaker who's in the space making videos for businesses or nonprofits, like, you know, in, in this commercial space, we have to remember this. We're filmmakers. Okay. That's the artist in us. Okay. That's the movie maker. That's only half of what we do for our clients. We make pretty films. Like that's, that's important to us as filmmakers. We need to be marketers. Our job is to be marketers. They're using our video as a marketing tool. So it is part of our business. We need to know it. And so the thing is, your client who hires you cares about one thing. They don't care about, they might think your films are pretty and they might say, oh, I like that. But what they really care about is ROI. That's it. If you don't give them ROI, they don't really want to spend the money. They're investing money into you, a video marketing firm, <laughs> you know, and they're expecting this investment to make them money. And so, we need to, as businesses, as video businesses, we need to put the filmmaker hat on when the time is right. We need to put the, the marketing hat on when the time is right. Very simple formula. If, if somebody doesn't know anything about marketing or they're scared about it or they think it's sleazy, you know, it's not. If you want to be a used car salesman and be sleazy, well, then be sleazy. But you don't have to be. There are, you could sell with integrity. You can sell and care. Mercedes right? don't sell their cars with anything other than elegance and class. And that's why. And they're, and they're premium natural. products. Yeah. They're, they're, so the, 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 here's, a, here's a simple formula, right? And you can make this into a, a 60 second video or a five minute video or whatever you want it to be. Identify a problem. Explain the solution. Connect your company to the solution and give at least one reason why you're better than your competition. That's it. Problem, solution, connect your company, differentiator, close it out with a call to action. You can do that in 60 seconds, you know? And, and, and so, you know, you could start there and then get more complex and build out other variations of that idea. But it's our job to, to solve those problems. It's our job to make a tool that's used for marketing. We're not just here to make videos. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes we're hired by a marketing agency. They already have the messaging and the scripting and everything planned out. And they just need a production company to do the job. And that's fine too, right? Especially when you're working with a good agency and you, you're, you know, you admire each other's work and, it, and it's, oh, this is going to be great. But in the end, if, you know, for us anyway, a lot of our clients come to us, you know, and they, they're, they don't, you know, they're the company itself. We're, we're dealing directly with the, the 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 company as opposed to a marketing agency and so and, and you're going to make more money that way as well you know you're going to make more money direct to client I, i'll just finish with this um a very successful marketer friend of mine ben said you must always remember then that your product and service is the obstacle in the way of the client getting what they want but they see it as a necessary evil because they've got to promote their message. And so if you're making videos for, for a living, then the videos, the prop, the videos, the obstacle, they don't want to make a video. They don't want to spend money making a video. They have to spend the money telling a story so they can get the result, which is usually selling more of the stuff they want to sell. I think that's brilliant. And if you don't mind, if I can ping pong off that thought, my elevator pitch right now is based around communication. Communication is key. Communication is the most important aspect of any business, whether you're communicating externally or internally. And I believe video is the most powerful way to communicate. So I haven't, I'm not finished with my elevator pitch, but the point is what you just said, the barrier, if it was me, I would turn that barrier into the communication. 
So you, you, you need to spend money for this necessary evil to get your reward. Well, you're investing in communication, crystal clear messaging. And the way we do it back to the pitch is that we, we communicate through video and we do it through creative storytelling and crystal clear messaging. And so I pose this question to businesses. Do you believe communication is important to your business growth, both internally to your staff and externally to your customers? Do you believe communication is important? Yes. Who's going to say no? Do you believe video is a powerful way to communicate? In my eyes, the most powerful way to communicate. Yes or no? There are not many people that are going to say no. Right? Yes, yes. So they now know and admitted that they know video is an amazing tool to solve a major problem, which is to communicate this thing that you need to communicate to this person. In this case, I have a product or service. I need to communicate it to this customer. And I know the thing in the middle, the barrier is an amazing communication tool. Why would I not invest in that? So I drive everything this year is actually when I came up with this, this pitch, which is I, I needed to reinvent myself. We're a communication company. That's what we do. I love it. May it's been amazing catching up again and let's not leave it three years next time. No, no, not at all. We'll, 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 we'll we should pick like some micro topics and just hang on those. I know we're just kind of, you know, we're riffing here and I love that. But I would love to dive into some, uh, you know, some business book ideas that yeah. we've learned over the years and just like, you know, have, have fun with that one time. So we should absolutely do that.